it is, we have a really fun dinner speaker tonight. Um, at least he's been a huge help to us for 15 or 20 years now, we think, Arthur. Um, so years ago, when we were setting up our egg donor program, and we found ourselves in need of a whole ethics board, one of our board of trustees, who isn't here tonight, one said, my best friend's an ethicist. And so we got to meet his best friend, the ethicist, who is Dr. Arthur Applebaum, and a very distinguished ethicist. Um, Arthur took his did his graduate work at, at uh, undergraduate work at Princeton, and he came to Harvard Kennedy School to do his graduate work in political ethics, something like that. Um, one of Arthur's area of, of interest and expertise is civil disobedience. And he has been a huge help to us to design the how do you, how do you manage egg don how do you manage women donating eggs for research? We've had a bunch of lunch meetings at um, Harvard Square. I'm in this bind, Arthur. What do I do next? Um, and so he's been a huge help. And last March, we had to have another not emergency meeting, but we had to have another intense meeting as we have developed a new access to human eggs. And so we had to make sure that this was being done appropriately, that we were setting up all the consent forms correctly, and Arthur has been a huge help for that. So because we have our, our one of our speakers tonight has been involved in this controversial new field of human gene editing, I asked Arthur, and this is this is controversial in some areas, not so controversial in other for other people. And so I asked Arthur if he would like to address this. And so he came up with this interesting title of, yes, he would be happy to address this. I also want to put in a little plug. Arthur has a new book that was just <laughs> out this week. Um, and he can tell you a little bit more about that, but it looks really interesting. So we are privileged to have, and I have been grateful to this person for decades, almost decades now, to help guide our work and um, keep me out of jail. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. That's, that's right. I, I'm the reason Anne has never been indicted. Um, actually, really not true. So, like some people think that uh, things are morally questionable in proportion to how many questions you could ask about it. But actually, it turns out that the answer to most questions are, don't worry about it, it's fine. And go ahead, it's OK, don't worry, I got your back. So um, I, I'm a really good person to chair Anne's um, Ethics Advisory Board, because I've never met a stem cell experiment that I didn't like. Um, but maybe that doesn't extend to human uh, gene editing. This is one of my favorite, favorite um, old, old engravings. It's uh, anonymously done in 1590. It's called the Fool's Cap Map. And in a world that may be falling apart, in a world that you think may be ruled by fools, I think it's a particularly appropriate, so appropriate that I actually made it, here's the plug, I made it the cover of my book. If you had asked me at any moment in over the last who knows how many years, how are you doing, Arthur? I'd say, oh, I'm finishing my book, I'm finishing my book. But now I can finally say, I finished my book, it shipped this week. So, um, thank you. And I'm not just plugging my book, I actually, uh, uh, my talk will be in part about the legitimate authority to make these kinds of decisions. So I'm going to talk about who should get to decide about the uh, editing of uh, the germline uh, genes. Uh, but I'm going to begin by talking about the predicament that we're in. And of course, I will talk about the, subs the ethical substance. I think it's obviously related to who should make the decision. But I, I will insist on making a distinction between the, um, the issues and what might be the correct answer to some issues. How we should go about setting up a procedure for making decisions in light of what we think the issues are, and not be too glib about how things should be decided. Because what what, what we'll see in the you know, in the words of very very smart, very talented scientists who are very well intentioned, um, they fall back on this idea that well the people should decide, or it should be a social consensus, without any clue whatsoever what 
why that is important, how you would get it or know that you got it if you, if, if you got it, and, and why that should be the standard. Okay, let, let's just start, I mean, I, I realize that almost all of you are quite familiar with the story, but you know, a, after some uh, experimental successes using CRISPR to edit uh, the genes, not ethically in any respect problematic as far as I'm concerned, um, there was a, a international summit uh, convened with uh, David Baltimore chairing it, um, and it was uh, in the auspices of a, a whole bunch of rather uh, prominent scientific uh, organizations. And um, what they concluded was that clinical use of germline editing would be irresponsible until there's a resolution of safety and efficacy issues, duh, and broad societal consensus. That's going to be the soporific meme. It's like broad, everyone agrees, broad societal consensus. Um, and again, that's going to be one, one of my themes. Um, then what happens is a doctor. Uh, he Zhuangqi in uh, China decides basically on his own to, um, I mean, the, the background of this is just preposterous. So he's, um, there's a, a couple, the man is HIV positive, and instead of doing any number of solutions, many of which Anne, our Anne pioneered, how to you know, create a baby who you know, is HIV negative, he decides that CRISPR is the answer, and he uh, edits out the uh, CCR5 gene, which may or may not give these babies uh, resistance to one possible uh, HIV um, uh, virus. And um, he announces to the world that he's done this thing. And to the, you know, the credit of the scientific community, he's universally condemned. He's fired from his university. He hasn't been seen in a while. We don't actually know his whereabouts. Uh, the Chinese National um, uh, um, what, is it, what is it called? It's the Academy National Academy of Sciences. The Chinese National Academy of Sciences says it's a gross violation of regulation, strong condemnation, extremely irresponsible scientifically and ethically, and poor Dr. Hay hasn't been heard from since. Um, rather quickly, like within, within the month, a second summit is uh, convened. Again, David Baltimore chairing it. And um, they quite rightly says that th this particular move was deeply disturbing and irresponsible. And here's what we need to do. We need to have independent oversight, compelling medical need, absence of reasonable alternatives, plan for long term attention to self effects work, uh, risks too great to allow clinical trials um, of germline editing, and it's time to define rigorous, responsible translational pathways. So already they're kind of saying, but we've got to do this. Let's just do it the right way and call for an international forum without actually saying what kind of international forum it should be. This was not um, sufficient to a number of people, so Eric Lander and a host of his colleagues uh, recently, fairly recently published uh, a paper in uh, an editorial, really, a commentary in Nature, Adopt the Moratorium on Heritable Genome Editing. And this is what they concluded. So they're actually much more specific about what could happen. For a fixed period, they suggest five years, uh, no clinical uses. Uh, and then, of course, form an international coordinating body. Their proposal is under uh, WHO, but not necessarily. And then, then individual nations should make their own decisions. How? A period of public not notice, and they propose two years. And within that period of time, careful and transparent evaluation of uh, various scientific and ethical issues, and then determination of, again, a broad societal consensus. Okay. Uh, let me go through some of the substantive reasons that should give us concern, and then see if we can kind of match up the procedural responses that presumably are tailored to meeting of these um, considerations. And the, you know, the, the problems with the technology and the science are, are obvious, number one, and I'm not a scientist, but I would imagine that since all of you in this room, you're really good at what you do, they will eventually be resolved, right? So the problem, so one obvious problem with Dr. Hay jumping in and trying to fix these twins is that the technology hasn't improved, it's not reliable, we don't know if there'll be off-target mutations, we don't know if there'll be only partial replacing, you'll get a mosaicism, which could cause problems. Um, you fix one gene and you don't know, you might not know for a very long time whether there are interactions with other genes or with the environment. Um, and, and this is, I think, one of the driving considerations, which I completely endorse. It. Yeah. Um, the science is totally cool. The, the, the medical need, in, in, in part thanks to what Anne and colleagues are doing, the medical need is, is not obviously pressing. There, there, are, there are very, very few conditions for which you need to 
engage in gene editing of the term line in order to prevent an offspring who is a carrier or has a genetic disease because you know, there's all sorts of pre-implantation pre screening that you can do. You can screen the sperm, you could screen the embryo and select the embryos. Um, so unless you have, let's say, I mean, the example that everyone uses is Huntington's disease where it's a dominant, uh, the, the, the gene for the disease is dominant so that you, you know that the child will get it. Um, there isn't a medical necessity, and of course, as we know, there's no medical necessity to give couples genetically related children. So we're not actually treating the child when we're doing this. You know, so we're not, we're not, it, it, it's unclear who the patient is and what the medical need is engaging this. Um, so it requires first believing that there's a serious problem here that not everyone on the planet can produce a genetically related child, and then it's reaching immediately for a solution that may in fact not be the most obvious available solution to giving that person or that couple a genetically related child. So, so it's, it's just some, again, science cool as can be, it's at this point at least when we're talking about ger germline fixing of you know, bad, bad alleles, it, the medical need doesn't seem to be so great. Now, somatic, you know, um, you know use of somatic germ editing obviously is a fantastically important thing to do, but that's not this problem. Right? And then, of course, there's the question of enhancement. Once we get really, really good at this, then there might be all sorts of things that we might want to change about um, things. Um, so the safety and efficacy consider considerations, of course, but again, uh, unless you're Dr. Hay in China, everyone agrees that these are important things, and everyone, I think, agrees that it will take, take some time before we work out the technological kinks. There are other considerations. There are just consi justice considerations. Um, and I've listed a number of them. It's not an exhaustive list. list. One, there are these unfairness ar arguments that, well, this is going to be an expensive therapy and only rich people will have access to it. And the other one that lots of people seem to fasten on, you know, is that if we, this becomes used for enhancement, then there'll be these huge distributive, distributive justice problems because only rich people will enhance their children, right? So someone will be selling the Stanford package, right? So you could fix your baby. <laughs> your baby will get into Stanford. But, you know, I, I'm not terribly moved by this consideration. And to show why, I'm going to run an um, experiment. I didn't clear it with Anne's Ethics Review Board, but I know one of its members fairly well, and I think he <laughs> would mind. Um, I'm quite sure I know what the main effect is. The, the differential effect may, may fall flat, but um, if you are over 50 years old, raise your hand. If, keep your, no, keep your hands up. Okay. If both of your parents went, got a degree from a four-year college, put your hands down, otherwise leave your hand up. So there are a few people who have at least one parent who didn't go to college. Okay. Now, if you're under 40, raise your hands. Okay. If both of your parents went to a four-year college, put your hand down. Oh, so the differentiate didn't work. I was going to make the. I was guessing. I was guessing that uh, this is kind of rather age correlated. That the younger you are, the more likely it is that both of your parents went to college. And it turns out that higher education is a dominant allele for high social status and high wealth, right? Uh, if you have both parents who are rich, that's even better. But like, there are so many sources of social inequality. There are so many different ways that this, um, you know, this. Uh, advantageous de gene called high social status and wealth is transmitted to offspring. That the very, very low down on our list should be the worry about the Stanford package, right? So, so I really don't think that the, if you care about distributive justice, there are other things you should care about um, more than that. And then this idea, so th there's something that people, I think, don't quite get right. So. Um, this stuff can, in fact, be dangerous and have unintended consequences. And it is absolutely horrible, absolutely horrible, if you are the baby about whom a terrible mistake has been made. You may not survive. You may survive with har in a horribly you know, compromised or even monstrous circumstance. Um, there's a set of critics who immediately jump from how horrible it would be to be an individual baby damaged by CRISPR to the idea that humanity will be damaged. Now, 
Think of what has to happen before, before you, you, you would, this would have to be a technology that is used in a widespread way. And used in a widespread way before we figure out that it's actually a stinker and causing damage. Before you will have, in any substantial way, changed the human genome. What's going on here is a, is a kind of, it, it's, it's not so much slippery slope as much as floodgates. Right? There are a bunch of people who think that if you do this once, it then becomes unstoppable. And if it becomes unstoppable, you have ruined the human, the, the human species forever. And, and that just requires a, a set of resolutions about very small likelihood probabilities that are completely implausible. Uh, and here's one reason why, and I say this not callously, but um, if, this star, if this starts to happen, there in fact will be unfortunate mishaps. There will be tragedies. There will be severely damaged babies. And, and that, in fact, will have, will have a moderating effect on the speed in which this happens. Right? So again, we have lots of other things to worry about, like we're burning up the planet, before we have to worry about burning up the genome. So, so I really do think this is a, a, rather, a rather distant consideration. Yes? Like errors. The huh? impact of errors in the same thing, when the wrong sperm or egg get together and get transferred to the wrong body, even. Uh, uh, sure. And, and of course, like, when you're thinking of um, medically induced errors, right? This is always going to be a rather small proportion of the medically induced errors that our patients are going to uh, suffer from. A, a consideration is a consideration. The, you know, the disability community thinks, that, well, if you're going to go out and fix my gene, then you're saying that I'm somehow not, I don't have a life worth living, and we're not saying that at all, right? Your life is worth living now that you're here with us. Um, but, um, and you may think, and this ap ap often happens in the, in the capital D deaf community, that you know, deafness isn't a disability, it's a way of life, it's a culture. You are perfectly entitled to believe that, right? Uh, but you shouldn't decide for other people whether their children are born deaf or not. And this last point that I've made is going to be very important to the idea of who gets to say. Right? Whose values about this sort of thing are values that should govern how I live my life and how I raise my children? And which sorts of values are appropriate candidates for using the law to impose on other people? So there are another set of uh, subset of reasons that I'm going to call perfectionist reasons, and it's called perfectionist in the literature because they're, they, they involve having a view of having the, the perfect set of values. And these, I, th these I think, are, are, are much more suspect, right? And uh, it's a little hard to pin down what these, what these um, considerations are because the people who hold them are so filled sometimes with, it's so obvious to them and they're so filled with the disgust that they often just splutter about it, right? Um, and I, I'm not saying that they don't have good reason to splutter, but I will push back on is whether their spluttering should affect what we do. So the notion that you're devaluing humanity when you're tinkering with the, the germline, it's, it's hubris, you're playing God, um, and you're devaluing the human embryos. There, there's a very, I think, just as a political, not political philosophy, just kind of ordinary politics. I think there's a emerging and interesting coalition between kind of you know, left environmental you know, justice warriors, let's say, and right anti-abortionists who can actually agree about something. This, you know, there's a coalition that actually agreed many years ago, not, not unhelpfully about pornography. So it turned out that uh, the feminist left and the religious right agreed that Pornography is something that should be suppressed. And I think that we have the same kind of coalition emerging over um, these kinds of questions because there are, there's a religious sensibility that is not particularly interested in the details of gene editing. They just think that it's absolutely wrong to muck with embryos any which way. This is mucking with embryos. Therefore, it's one, morally wrong. And two, if we have the political wherewithal to stop it, we're entitled to try to stop it. Now, I think that people who are engaging in these perf perfectionist objections are missing a step in their argument. Right? They have a theory of value. They have a moral view about what a good life is. And without taking another step, they immediately move to the idea that 
their moral views are the proper subject for coercive legislation. Their law, law should follow from their ideas. And um, every liberal constitutional democracy, and by liberal here I don't mean left of center, I mean caring about liberty, right? And any, any rights respecting democracy makes, the f makes a distinction between the public sphere that's properly regulable and the non-public or private sphere. That's up to us to decide. Now, societies draw this line in different places, and philosophers and constitutional scholars argue vociferously about where that line is to be drawn, but, but there is a line somewhere. And so, if your objection to editing the germline is one of these reasons, there's an additional step in the argument that I'm not hearing. You have to go from my yuck response that this is morally stinky to step, 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 step. Why it is that this is the kind of consideration that I'm entitled to oppose, impose upon all of my society. Right? And, and th those, are, those are the arguments that I, I find missing. So now I'm going to start to introduce procedural reasons, but they're, they're going to be related to the substantive account that I, I just gave you uh, and to give proper way to it. OK, so now let me, I'm a philosopher. Let me just back up a step. So um, here's the problem we've been struggling with for a few hundred years now. Rousseau asks the best question. His, his answer, maybe not so much, but his question is fantastic. Man is born free, and everywhere he's in chains, meaning we're all subject to coercive law. How did this change come about? I do not know, meaning he's not going to tell us this origin story about an actual social contract. Um, what can make it legitimate? I believe that I can solve this question. And the, the basic form of his answer is that we can be genuinely free, though governed by course of law, if we are in some sense, and we have to make this sense uh, more legible and apparent, we're in some sense collectively self-governed. So if we are the authors of our own course of law, then that's a way of reconciling the fact that we are both free but also subject to law. And now, I have a, speci a specification of it in the book that I just wrote. <coughs> uh, when are persons collectively self-governing? When they are free individual agents who constitute a free group agent that governs them in order to realize and protect their freedom. So, so the picture here is the way that we solve this Rousseau's puzzle is that we have to somehow participate in our collective decision making so that we constitute an agent. And by an agent, I mean an entity that is capable of considering reasons for action, making choices that follow from those considerations, and then being able to act on those considerations. Um, so if I'm right, let's go back. So if I'm right, there are going to be not just procedural um, requirements, like one person, one vote, democracy, but there will, in fact, be substantive preconditions. Certain kinds of questions are not the proper questions for coercive law. Because if certain kinds of questions are simply put up to a democratic vote, then that would be imp improperly restrictive of our freedom. Okay. So this is, a, this is a, an approach to show why the conditions of legitimacy, of legitimate authority, will be in part procedural, in part substantive, and there really isn't a conflict. Let me, let me start with a little, um, little cute example. Let's imagine this country called majoritarian. Majoritarian is a universal participatory direct democracy. Everyone has an equal vote, right? Complete deliberation, fair procedures, societal consensus, if you wish. Okay. And they enact the following legislation. I'm going to call it the One True God Act, and that mandates the worship of the One True God. And they did it freely and openly and deliberatively. Um, and so you might imagine. Um, bunch of citizens of majoritaria debating this. Uh, and do you want to play the part of Demi? Sure. OK. And who wants to play the part of Libby? Yes, Libby. OK. And say it with feeling. I propose that we decide whether to institute mandatory worship of the own. One true God? Of the one true God by majority rule. Majorities do not have legitimate <laughs> authority to decide whether to <laughs> mandate worship of the one true God. I propose <laughs> that we decide whether majorities have legitimate authority to decide to mandate worship of the one true God but by and. majority rule. <laughs> but and. Majorities do not have legitimate authority to decide whether majorities 
have legitimate authority to decide. <laughs> to mandate worship of the one true God by majority rule. And we know how this goes. Right? This, this, is turtle, this is turtles all the way down. If we let them go on forever, they will continue to go on forever. Um, what, what's, 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 what's going on here, right, is what Libby rightly is saying to Demi is that there is no pure procedure even if the pure, pure procedure is universal, participatory, complete uh, deliberation, fair procedure, there is no pure procedure under which whatever the outcome of that procedure is, that's fine and good, that's the proper exercise of legitimate authority. Because I am stipulating right, that a law that requires citizens to worship the one true God, oh, and how do we know who the one true God is? Well, it's the one true God of the majority, that any such law is not, in fact, a legitimate law. That, that would be an abuse of the coercive power of the state. Okay, at least one example why a pure procedure is not going to deliver the answer and why you know, broad societal consensus is not going to deliver the answer. Okay. So there is a philosopher very dear to my heart, John Rawls, I'm, I suppose, a Rawlsian, who um, has an account of these kinds of constraints or restrictions or uh, the, the kinds of reasons that are proper for use in coercive law and the kinds of reasons that aren't proper. And he calls this, uh, this approach to it the, the, the uh, idea of public reason. He thinks that you need to use what he calls public reason. It's, it's, a, it's a technical term, but he means I, I, reasons that are publicly accessible, reasons that I can in good faith say are not just reasons for how I live my life, but I believe that um, Treating you as a fair and equal citizen, I can reciprocally expect you to, if not agree with me, at least think that it's the kind of reason that ought to be used for course of law. And reciprocally, I will graciously accept your laws, even if I don't agree with them, if they are of the kind of consideration right, that meet this test of reciprocity. Right? So how is it possible? And by the way, he's not just ganging on religious people. He's ganging up on all sorts of thick, deep philosophies like Kant, even though he's a Kantian. Mill, Mill believes in experiments in living, but he doesn't, but, Kant, but Rawls doesn't think that you can be a million police and require of little school children to engage in experiments in living if their parents are traditional and they, they, want, their parents, they want the children to be respectful of, of tradition. Okay? The, the answer to this problem, right, um, is that you have to explain your ideas and gra ground your ideas in a way that is consistent with the equal liberties of other reasonable and free citizens. And that's, you're tr we're treating each other as free and equal um, when we offer each other fair terms of cooperation and we agree to act on those terms even if our particular philosophies may not fare all that well. Okay, and here's the money quote. The idea of political legitimacy based on the criterion of reciprocity says, our exercise of political power is proper only when we sincerely believe that the reasons we would offer for our political actions, were we to state them as government officials, are sufficient, and we also reasonably think that other citizens might also reasonably accept those reasons. <laughs> and I am proposing, yeah, it, this idea of reasonability is like a little bit of circular here, but you know, read the book, not my book, his book. Um, <laughs> but you, 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 see this, you see this sensibility. The, the sensibility here is we should treat each other with reciprocity. We shouldn't, when we have a momentary majority advantage, impose our way of life on <laughs> others. But rather, we prescind and figure out how to create you know, common ground, grounded in reasons that we could, here's the wiggle word, reasonably share, not actual share. It's not, it's not a call for unanimity, right? But that it's, so it's not so much the, the particular content of my legislation, but the kind of reason I'm offering. So here are the kinds of reasons that are proper. Well, this is the way to treat people as free and equal. Right? This is what's required for mutual advantage. Here's the kind of reason that's improper. My God told me so, right? I, have a, I think the way you're living your life is really stinky. It doesn't affect me anyway, in any way, but I just think you're living a stinky life. So those are the kinds of considerations that we should prescind from. Okay. And those who believe um, that their whole view about morality should determine law are, are just, according to him, just not being reasonable. Right? Political liberalism views this insistence on the whole truth in politics as incompatible with democratic citizenship and the idea of legitimate law. Okay, let's try another little puzzle. 
This one is a little place I invented called Randomark. So Randomark has universal participatory democracy, and unlike majoritarian, it has a constitution and courts that protect basic rights and liberties, so you couldn't have the one true God out in Randomark. But here's how they instantiate the equality of citizens. They randomly enact citizens' proposals by lottery. So every Wednesday afternoon, it was a way of expressing our political equality. We each put our proposal for legislation into the bin, and randomly and equally, they pull it out. And this Wednesday afternoon, Friday evening, we enact the pi equals 3.2 law. <laughs> because it makes it easier on school children. But you're laughing. This, this actually happened. happened. This actually happened in the grand state of Indiana. Well, it passed one of the houses. This, by the time it gets to the Senate, they actually, they actually came, to, came to their senses. So um, you could read it. You know, some amateur and not very good mathematician offered a proof for squaring the circle. And the way the proof faultily worked is he's kind of unintentionally smuggled in a line which, whose implication is that pi would equal exactly 3.2. And that almost became law in Indiana. Now, why is why is the pi equals 3.2 law completely preposterous? Because you lose a whole slice of pizza every time. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, first of all, it's false, right? <laughs> first of all, it's false. Se se second of all, even if it's true, you don't decide the truth of mathematical propositions by majority rule, by legislation, <laughs> right? <laughs> but the third thing, and that's what I want to focus on. You don't decide things by random draw. Because, remember, my, my first proposition was that here's how we can reconcile being under coercive law with being free. It's if we participate in this collective agency, if we are agents of a certain sort. But this is just a random process. An individual who engaged in this way would just be this random desire generator. Right? Suppose you decided what to do every morning by flipping a coin. Right? You, you would, in some important sense, not be an agent anymore. You, you would just be a probabilistically driven event manufacturer, right? And you would somehow lose, lose your agency. That's true about individuals, and I want to make the claim that it's also true collectively. Okay, I need two more volunteers to read. Let's, let's do it. No, come let's, on, let's do it. Tom. You guys want to do it again? All right. They were pretty good. There you go. You, you, you've gotten good at it. Okay. I propose that we decide the value of pi by equally weighted random lottery. An equally weighted random lottery is not a legitimate method to decide <laughs> the value of pi. Well, I propose that we decide whether lotteries are a legitimate method for deciding the value of pi by gathering up proposals for methods of determining pi and choosing the winner by equally winning the lottery. And a lottery is not a legitimate method for deciding whether well, lotteries are a legitimate method for deciding and the value of pi. Again. And you know what's coming up now? How many turtles all the way down? Right? So, I mean, if you actually had a poli if you actually had a political society that actually went about this way, that they would be incapable of action. If by action you don't simply mean movement. Right? But action as the sort, you know, a, a, a behavior that follows from a choice, that follows from a proper consideration of reasons. Okay. I've been talking about agent. Well, what is an agent? An agent, the, is an entity that's capable of action, not merely an event generator, and has these three properties. You know, considering in response to reasons, willing or choosing in response to those considerations, and doing, having your actions guided by what your choice was. And notice, very cleverly, these are not psychological properties. So it is possible that perhaps we together in this room can be an agent, can be a group agent. And that's my proposal. We can fail to be an agent. We can be, so there's a marvelous philosopher, Harry Frankfurt. So you may have heard of Harry Frankfurt, because he's famous for a little book called On Bullshit. Uh, it was a clever, clever article that he published in an obscure journal in the 1980s. And then Princeton University, he's a, he was, he's retired now, but he's a, a professor at Princeton. And some clever editor at Princeton University Press decided this would make a good stocking stuffer for Christmas. So they printed up this article in a little, little tiny red book, and he became this overnight sensation. And remember, this is long before our current predicament. This little book called On Bullshit. 
And I mean, he's this philosopher, philosopher with a big bushy beard. And he's on the Dick Cavett show. He's being interviewed all over the place. And he plays it completely straight, because that's what he is. He wrote a serious philosophical account of bullshit. Um, so that's what he's most famous for, about bullshit. But he's also famous for this idea of a wanted in an early paper of his, 1971. So he's distinguishing between persons and wantons. Uh, it's a rather overheated to talk about what he's going to call wantons as non-persons, but they're, they're non-agents. So here's the thing about a person. A person has a structure of the will where I have these desires, these competing desires, and then I reflectively endorse one of my desires. I, I choose which desire to act upon. A want, I have second order desires or second order volitions. A wanton on his telling, and, and it's, it's a hypothetical abs, uh, you know, uh, construct. It's not as if any, more, any human being is a wanton all the time, but we are all wantons some of the time. A wanton is someone who just takes, follows his or her strongest, strongest desire or takes the vector sum of his or her desires. And when you ask a wanton, why did you do that? The wanton is just kind of puzzled. Well, well that was my strongest desire. Of course, I, uh, I didn't really choose it. I just kind of went with the flow of my strongest desire. And Harry Frankfurt says, that, that person, that, that, per, that creature is a wanton and isn't a full-fledged person, if by person we mean someone capable of reflective, uh, rational agency. Okay? And he says something a little curious. I mean, he's writing in 1971, I believe. No animal other than man, however, appears to have the capacity for reflective self-evaluation that is manifested in the formation of second order desire. This is not an a priori philosophical claim. You show Harry today a, a dolphin or a, you know, or um, uh, an ape or maybe even an octopus, and you know he might concede the empirical point. But in any case, even at, at, at this moment that when he wrote it, it was false because groups. Remember I said that to have these three capacities doesn't actually require psychology. It's something that we might be able to do together through our procedures or through the way that we organize ourselves. Groups may have that capacity collectively of self-evaluation and have the capacity for considering, choosing, and doing. Ah, but groups may fail to have that capacity. And so we may become not a group person, a group agent. We may fail at that and be a group wanton. And I think this has always threatened collective action, has always threatened majoritarian democracy, and we are going through a period of world history, not just in the United States, in Great Britain, around the world, where failures of group agency are especially damaging and potent. Okay? Want and misrule um, threatens legitimacy. One, a bumper sticker version of one of the arguments in my book is, a ruler who cannot govern himself cannot legitimately govern others. We're being governed by random processes by incontinence, inconstancy, incoherence. Um, and you can have incoherent good, uh, group trust. So just, again, I don't want to beat up on American society, though there's much to uh, comment about. Let's just take a simple example. It's, it's one little corner of the irrationalities of Brexit, right? The problem of the Irish backstop. Imagine we have three, three uh, voters in the UK, um, and they have to decide on three issues, and you know, each one is individually rational in that they line up these three views in a way that is coherent. So you have to decide whether you should exit the EU. EU the majority of, um, at least as of the referendum of three years ago, the majority wanted to leave the EU. Um, should we leave the Irish bo the border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic open? Yes, the majority wants to leave it open. Should we leave the um, Irish Sea open so there's no, no custom controls between Northern Ireland and the, and, the, and the UK? Yes, we should leave that open too. But of course, you can't actually hold all three views in your same way. You can't actually exit the EU, have an open Irish border, and have an open British border across the Irish Sea. That's precisely what gr the UK has been intransitively circling around for the last three years. And I said it's only one of the issues that generates these intransitivities. Okay. Um, is this just an unfortunate result of a particular configuration of preferences, or is it more endemic? My um, colleague at Harvard, uh, in Har the philosopher Harvard, Christine Korsgar, has this marvelous image, which I'm going to share with you. Um, imagine I got a bag. You're all scientists, so you can appreciate this. Uh, a lot of you work on, on mouse, mouse gene lines, yes? What? Oh, we do have a bat, but I'm not going to use that bat. Oh, whose bag is this? 
<laughs> okay, we'll use this bag. Okay. So, <laughs> imagine I've got a bag and a dozen mice, and I stick, well, this bag is a little too heavy for my example. I stick a, a dozen mice in a lightweight bag, wrap it up, tie it up, put the bag on the floor. I got two questions for you. Will the bag move? Mice are alive, you know. It's certainly going to bubble, you're going to bubble a little, up a little bit. And if it turns out that more mice are kind of randomly going this way than that way, the, the bag will move. That's, that's, that's easy. Question number one. Question number two. Will the bag act? No. The bag is incapable of acting. Right? It'll move. It'll, it'll follow the vector sum. Right? Vector arithmetic will tell us which way the bag, but, but it cannot act. Okay, now take a hundred million American voters and tie them up in a bag. Will the bag move? Yes. Well, oh, yes, there will, there will be a result, right? Well, in 2000, it took a while to get the result. My, 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 my twin IVF daughters, and one of the other reasons why I, am, when Anne calls, I respond. Um, they were three years old for the 2000 election, and we very solemnly walked to our polling place in Somerville, and, and um, you know, we cast our ballots, and then we took them home, and put them to bed, and said, sweethearts, in the morning, we'll know who the president is. And in the morning, we didn't know who the president was, <laughs> and nor the next morning, nor the next morning. And so I had to explain to my three-year-old daughters what the problem was. I said, well, they're having a hard time counting the votes. So my, my yes. three, the chats. So my three-year-old daughters said, well, Daddy, what's the problem? Just take the ballots, line them up, and count them. <laughs> and she actually had a better idea than the entire state of Florida. <laughs> okay. so, so if you are moved by this mice in a bag example, it's not just a contingent problem of preferences being arranged in an awkwardly intransitive way. It's a problem that, assault, that afflicts all majoritarian procedures. We're just mice in a bag if all we want to do is, is count our votes. Um, now, in the tradition of political philosophy, a different writers were more or less attentive to this problem. Locke who otherwise I think is terrific, Locke was insufficiently attentive. Locke's justification for majority rule is basically saying, well, it is necessary the body should move that way whether the greater force carries it. Locke is offering a mice in a bag argument for a majority rule. And you know what? Sorry, Johnny Locke, it doesn't work. Hobbes, who precedes him, is much more alert to the problem than Locke. Hobbes says, a multitude of men are made one person when they are by one man or one person represented, so that it be done with the consent of every one of that multitude in particular. For it is the unity of the representer, not the unity of the represented, that maketh the person one. And it is the representer that beareth the person, and but one person, and unity cannot otherwise be understood in multi multitude. So Hobbes' solution is, let us all take Anne as our representative, and unless Anne is suffering from multiple personality disorder, Anne has a unified brain, one wet brain that actually works in unity um, when she thinks it through, and she acts on behalf of all of us, so now we're acting together. Right? It's an argument for representative democracy. But he's too honest, so this could have been an analytic argument for, like a logical, conceptual argument for monarchy. Notice that he says, a multitude of men are made one person, whether by one man or one person. Capitalized P can be an artificial person. The person itself can be an aggregate. And so he has to allow for what, what we should do when we have a committee, and, uh, you know, an aristocracy, or you know, a representative body that's representing all of us. And his solution is crazy, but at least it's alert to the problem. So his solution is, he, he imagines, here's how you get unity when the decision maker is a body, a plural body. Well, we vote, and the no's, you know, suppose there are more no's than yeses. So you pair off each no with its yes, and they destroy each other. And that leaves an uncontested balance of no's, so you have unanimity again. Now, since we're talking about Hobbes, you always have to worry, does he mean destroy there metaphorically, or is he imagining there it is, we're, we're in the House of Parliament, we got our swords, and something comes up for a vote, we all pull out our swords, and the minority party says, okay, okay, you guys, okay, 
Let's, let's say it's unanimous. I don't want to lose my head, right? So it's not a good solution, but at least he's alert to the problem. It's the problem of getting unity out of multitude. So here's our problem, and I'm, I'm, now I'm going to come, come to discussion. How can we pull ourselves together when we face this procedural problem of trying to avoid being mice and bad, and this substantive problem, which is that if you simply ask ordinary people what should be the basis of coercive legislation, some of them will pick the right category. Oh, we should protect each other's freedoms. We should treat each other as equal. But some number of them, and perhaps that, that number that wins the majority, says, well, uh, you know, I like my way of life, and I find yours reprehensible. So I, I think that as long as I'm in the majority, I'm going to force you to live my life. Right? Um, so broad societal consensus, quite apart from being completely underspecified in these documents, um, I, I don't think solves our problem. And I think one of the, to, to kind of try to give a motivational account for this, I think that these are well-intentioned scientists who are fed up with the grind of real representative government and see inefficiencies and irrationalities and mistakes in legislation all the time, quite, pro quite properly so. And they reach for this fresh new idea that if only the people could come together somehow and talk it through, then, we will, then we'll somehow get to the answer. Now, th th this is strange for several reasons. One is, you haven't specified a mechanism whereby you're going to get broad societal consensus. We actually already have a mechanism. Right? Every two or four years, we actually go to the polls and we vote. And except in 2000, even my children can count up the votes. Right? And then we have these deliberative bodies, which actually fail to deliberate. But anyway, they deliberate at least as well as you know, a bunch of us would deliberate. Right? And we have regularized procedures for rendering public law. And you have a body of scientists who are suspicious of that, realize that they don't have the authority to simply determine what the right answer is to you know, CRISPR gene editing. And so they kind of punt it to society, not majoritarian society, but some kind of unspecified broad societal consensus. And they think that that is a necessary and sufficient condition. It's not necessary, because we already have something that creakily works, which is it's called representative democracy, right? And law, right? And a constitution. Uh, and there's no guarantee that it will give you the right answer. Because as I started by saying, um, there is no pure procedural legitimacy here. There is no procedure that you can set up without any substantive constraints, without you know, a bill of rights, without con constitutional content that whatever the answer is, well, that's the legitimate answer around here. That was the example of the uh, one true God. Okay? So it's only through established democratic procedure, procedures, as flawed as they are, subject to substantive constitutional constraints, as flawed as they are, that we can at least approximate a solution to the problem of who should decide. And I think that this reliance on broad societal consensus is simply a fanciful distraction. And I'll end there. Thank you, Arthur. But oh, wait. Thank you, Arthur. But now, what are we going to do? <laughs> we'll get a committee together. <laughs> we'll, get a commi we'll get an ethics advisory board together. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. That was an awesome taking us through. I haven't been back to any 16th century philosophers for a long time. Does anybody have any questions for author Tom? I'm sure you do. <laughs> you could be in role or out of role. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I, have a, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, Broad societal consensus, does it imply uh, not to proceed until there is a consensus in favor of? It doesn't really open it up to a consensus against, does it? Well, I suspect that. Um, so we face lots of serious problems, um, some of which require immediate action, 
They're, they're all important, like global warming, really important. Should we wait for broad societal consensus before? No, we should do something, right? So I suspect that the people who, just the opposite of what you're proposing, the people who are asking for broad societal consensus are saying so because they already know that this is a morally stinky thing. They want to slow it down or stop it. And so if they impose this requirement of broad societal consensus, they know it's going to take a really long time. That, that, that's what I think is the, the small p politics behind it. Again, it's, it's a conjecture, but I, I think that's what's going on. Right? What was your yeah. other question? Uh, oh, I was very interested in the perfectionist, because I, I, yes. I think I employ these arguments uh, wittingly or unwittingly myself. So <laughs> uh, I noticed hubris, plain God, uh, devalue humanity. I mean, this, this, these are common in old stories, like Greek myths and stuff. Yeah. I mean, this is the substance. So why, why are all the stories the perfectionist stories? Well, so so th there's nothing wrong with the story. So um, you may, you, people who think that this is hubris may, in fact, on the, on the one true best moral theory, be right. It may be hubris. It doesn't follow that you get to legislate anti-hubris. I'm drawing a distinction, and I, as I'm saying, it's a distinction that you will find in every single rights-respecting democracy, a distinction between the public and the non-public sphere. The line has to be drawn somewhere, right? And it's because the line has to be drawn somewhere, you need a argument how to go from what you think is morally valuable, or, or to use a technical term, morally stinky, to what you can require your fellow citizens to do or not to do. And the people who cry hubris don't supply that argument. So notice what I'm doing. I'm not saying their view of morality is false. It may, in fact, be true. There may, in fact, be a god who doesn't want us to play him. I don't have a view, well, I have a view about that, but I, I, I can't argue, I can't arm wrestle you into accepting my view about whether there in fact is a God who doesn't want us to you know, push him aside and play his role. That, that's something that's something we're going to have to leave to our own beliefs or lack of beliefs. Here's what I do believe as a matter of democratic political philosophy. Wherever we stand on that governs our, our lives, our families' lives, governs what we write about, governs how we think, governs how we argue with our friends, but doesn't argue, doesn't govern our neighbors, doesn't get imposed on our neighbors. So if you think the problem with gene editing is that no one but God should play God, you're entitled to believe that. But before you can write that into law, you need to take that next step, why that's appropriately a matter for law, and I haven't heard what that next step in the argument. Tom, uh, so let, let me just push back a bit on the broad societal consensus. Yeah. Because I can think of a couple of recent issues where yeah. it was not the political system, but rather it was broad societal consensus that drove an issue. One of them is same-sex marriage, yep. which clearly followed changing attitudes. Absolutely. And the second is uh, the legalization of marijuana for recreational yeah. purposes in Massachusetts also followed it. Politicians never led in that case at all. And the government never led in that case. The political process didn't lead. It actually followed. So I'm so glad you asked that question. Because I, I'm not realizing that I, what I said could have been misconstrued as um, taking ordinary grassroots politics and discussion to be irrelevant. No, not at all. My point is it's not authoritative. I agree. So, Another Brexit example. Okay. Cameron stupidly holds a referendum. By simple majority vote, you are going to dash the hopes of every you know, Brit British person under the age of 30 or 40 right, by letting their grumpy grandparents decide their fate. And we're going to decide the most basic question about our political affiliation. We're going to decide that by simple majority rule. That's not the sort of thing that should be decided by simple majority. We don't put the Bill of Rights up to simple majority. We don't, well, should we have religious coercion or, around here or not? Oh, let's put it to a vote, right? Like, should we, I mean, I'm 
betraying my position on Brexit, but I think that the European Union is an unfinished, exciting, new form of political association that the world has never seen before, and it could end badly, as it did when they made the mistake of having a currency union but not a fiscal union, which is kind of a stupid economic idea. It, the EU could end badly someday, but it's a grand, noble experiment that will keep Europe out of, out of war with each other, right? That was the, the origins, was to keep France and Germany from going to war again. It succeeded doing that quite well, right? It's a grand experiment that should not be terminated by a simple majority vote. Okay, so, but Cameron called the vote and he guessed wrong and he lost the vote. A case is brought before the Supreme Court of the UK. Finally, they have a Supreme Court. They didn't know it. They just simply had the law lords. Now they have a Supreme Court. A case was brought, and the Supreme Court correctly said, this is not a binding referendum. This has to be done through an act of parliament. Prime Minister May thought that she could just you know, invoke section or article 50 and, and start the process of leaving, and the court said, no, this has to be an act of parliament. In saying so, what was the court saying? The court was saying, and this is even stronger because there was actually a, a, a procedural a, a vote of the people. The court was saying, we don't decide these things by majority vote. We decide these things by act of parliament. We certainly, for sure, we don't decide these things by grassroots politics, by public opinion polls. Grassroots politics, great. Change people's minds, change the minds of politicians, change society. Public opinion polls, tell us what people think. If you're a politician, you want to be reelected, you should probably pay attention to public opinion polls. My question is one of, my claim is about legitimate authority. Do, do public opinion polls have legitimate authority? If they did, you wouldn't need elections. You just need more sophisticated polling. Do, does changes in social mores, I mean, I, I, it's breathtaking. I mean, the, the one shining piece of contemporary American culture is the rapidity in which the culture basically did an about face on uh, gay and lesbian people. It's absolutely astonishing and, and, and a cause for hope. I think the reason for it is once the closet started opening a little bit, people realized, oh, Cousin Max. Cousin Max is okay. Now I find out he's gay. And whoa, so how bad could it actually be? Right? So I, I think it was a marvelous, marvelous and extremely quick. Right? But here's what I wouldn't say. It, it took the Obergefell decision to change the law. You don't change the law by asking, you know, by kind of having a street protest, right? The law shouldn't follow that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank I always you. wonder what would I, happen if Lincoln had had a referendum. Yeah, that's right. We'd be two countries. Um, I have a, I want to thank you very much, Arthur. I think you all can appreciate why we love having Arthur as our ethics advisory board chairman. Um, although sometimes the decisions take a while. <laughs> but I want I want to give an example that's a little uh, that's a, it's on the same thing and a little more concrete. A few years ago, I was asked to write um, a Connecticut law review for the school law school, and the title was "What is an Embryo?" And I got very involved in it, and the law students did all the research, and it was an interesting review. And part of that, I realized that. Part of the reason that we were having this raucous debate in our, in our political in our newspapers and everything in the early 2000s, when Jamie Thompson reported that you could isolate stem cells from human embryos, is that in the 80s, when assisted reproduction became standard of care in this country, the scientists who were trying to push it forward sat in their labs and complained about the lack of public support. In England, they went ahead and they debated it. They pulled together a group of people, whether you like it or didn't like it, they debated the whole new science, we, this is happening, we need to, they set up a, a licensing board, whether you like it or not, they debated it, they got tired of the debate, they finally came up with some guidelines that don't make a lot of biological sense, but they were exhausted at the end of this, and they said, we're done. You can culture fertilized human eggs for two weeks in a laboratory. Done. That's become like the law of the land for no particular reason, okay? Except you begin to come to the point where Rudolph talked about today, where you begin to get neural tube cells, neural uh, precursor cells. So, but in contrast to that, 
in the 80s, in the same time point, people who were dying of HIV disease got very involved with their government. They went to Bethesda, they marched on the campus, and they said, we are dying and you will do something about it. And so the head of NIAID, Tony Fauci, looked out, he, he gives this as his godfather talk. He looked out and there were people literally camped on the lawn at NIH in tents with signs saying, we are dying, do something. And they did. So it's like, it's what Arthur is saying, you, can, you, you have to absolutely stay involved with these government decisions should they necessarily be made by mobs and people? It has to be made by some kind of process. And I don't know exactly what kind of process Arthur is advocating now. But I do know that the fact that we were in trouble in the 2000s with the stem cell was because we didn't have the same debate and discussions that they had in England 20 years prior. So I think that's probably where we are now with the gene editing thing. Somebody needs to not just fall back, I agree with Arthur, not just fall back and say, we're going to get broad public, somebody's got to step up and say, we're going to organize a group of people, we're going to debate this through, and we're going to come up with some ideas. And you guys can have input, but we're going to come up with some ideas. Would, that, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. So if anybody of you have any questions about it, this would be great. Thank you so much, Arthur. This is so st stimulating. We still have some dessert. <laughs> I don't know. You saved me dessert. Uh, we saved you dessert. I don't know if our bartenders are gone. But so thank you very much for a wonderful day. I'm so glad to see all of you. Thank you. Yeah.